Well, good morning. It's uh, good to be with you this morning, bringing God's message uh, to you and the message from God's Word. We're coming off a long series um, from the book of Acts. Uh, many of our small groups, it was a long study with Tim Keller. And uh, my small group actually asked if I was going to be quoting Tim Keller because I think they were kind of finding enough of Tim. And I said I wouldn't quote him, and uh, I won't be, but he was a valuable source for uh, an influence on this text. So I'm thankful for his, uh, his words that are, are staying with us. Last week, as Pastor Peter preached on that last chapter of Acts, one little piece really stuck out to me. Right at the end of uh, chapter 28, it says that Paul stayed in Rome for two years in a rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. And I was thinking about that because in light of some of the things that we read, some of the stories we read in Acts about how Paul was treated, I'm sure that some of the people who showed up at his door weren't there to watch the baseball game with him. I'm sure many came ready to argue and threaten but Paul welcomed all who came to him. And I think Paul's attitude dovetails nicely with uh, what we're going to talk about today. So let's take a look at our text. Uh, it's from the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. Uh, you can find this on page 1878 of your pew Bibles. And while you're finding that, just some, some background on, um, on this uh, book of Hebrews. It's, it's interesting in that it's one of these books we don't really know who the author is. Um, for a long time, it was thought to be one of uh, Paul's letters. If you have a really old Bible, it might have even said Paul's letter to the Hebrews, but it really doesn't match his, his style, his language, so they kind of think that Paul wasn't the, the author. Some think Apollos, um, other candidates, and uh, we're just not really sure. But what we do know, though, is that it was written to a group of Jewish converts, okay? And that's important as we, as we look to the text. But um, the author assumes they're very familiar with the Old Testament stories about Moses, about Joshua, um, the customs of the temple and the high priest that's mentioned throughout. And um, the author quotes the different prophets throughout the book. So there's an assumed knowledge of traditional Judaism and that comes through. Um, so our text from, from Hebrews 13, and we'll read the first three verses. Keeping, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. This is the word of the Lord. What do you think of when I say the word hospitality? You might think of fancy parties or, or considering that today is Super Bowl Sunday. Um, go San Francisco. Uh, you might be thinking about your party this afternoon or the party that you're going to. Um, I googled the word this week and got a mix of results that gave a lot of different dictionary definitions, uh, lots of links to sites dedicated to the hospitality industry, uh, hotels, restaurants, resorts. I even found a link to a TED talk titled, Why Hospitality Evangelism is Harmful. And I was like, wow. Sounds good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to click on this. It might be another source for my sermon. And unfortunately, the subtitle was Perpetuating Orthodox Ideology About Restaurant Service Over Burdened Staff Distorts Guest Expectations. And I didn't know there was an orthodox ideology about restaurant service, um, but it's probably not very helpful for our needs this morning. But I think it's safe to say we have widely varied ideas about hospitality and what hospitality is. And I think that when we look at our passage and some of the other passages in the Bible I'm going to look at this morning, we'll see that hospitality, from a Christian perspective, or Christian hospitality, 
is a bit different than what we were thinking. So today I want to look closer at the what, the why, and the how of Christian hospitality. The what, the why, and the how. So looking at our text, our first clue to what hospitality is comes in the first two verses. Verse 1 starts with the author encouraging his audience to keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. And this encouragement is meant to cover the behavior within the group of believers. This was a community of Jewish converts, the Hebrews, who formed into a community based on their shared belief that Jesus was the Messiah. They were a church for all practical purposes. And they were told to keep on loving each other with brotherly and sisterly love. That's pretty straightforward advice that we can take to heart right here at BCRC and within the broader Christian community. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. But verse 2 continues with this reminder. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. Now, some translations, uh, older versions of the NIV, like your pew Bibles, um, have this as entertain strangers. But hospitality is, I think, the better choice here. You see, the word that's being translated as entertain strangers or hospitality is philoxenia, uh, the Greek word, philoxenia. And that's made up of two other Greek words, philos and xenia. Philos Uh, if you remember, is the word for brotherly or sisterly love. We get Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love from this. And xenia, that's with an X, xenia means stranger or foreigner. Xenophobia is the fear or hatred of strangers. But philoxenia literally means to love strangers or foreigners. It's the exact opposite of xenophobia. Hospitality, then, means to show love to strangers or foreigners. So we have two encouragements. Love each other, and then don't forget to love strangers as well. And at this level, still, hospitality doesn't seem all that profound or radical until we look at it through the eyes of our ancient Jewish audience and not our modern Western eyes. You see, in biblical times, travel was a much bigger undertaking. You didn't just get off the highway and pick from Hampton or Quality or Sleep or Holiday Inns. And despite what we might think of from the Bethlehem story, inns were actually not all that common, and some of them were not all that nice. But thankfully for the ancient traveler, there was a well-established hospitality custom that most people followed. In most cultures and nations of the time, hospitality to strangers was an almost spiritual obligation. And this obligation had some serious expectations. The expectation was that you provided food and water and lodging for any stranger or foreigner in need. The way this worked is that if you were traveling and you came to a town where you intended to stay and rest, you would go to a public place like the city gates or or the town well, and you would wait for someone to approach you. And if you were a resident of the town and saw a traveler out there, it was your duty to approach them and ask them to stay with you. And this was not a light burden. The hospitality would often start with washing the feet of the guest, It wasn't just a nice gesture. It was a sign of uh, hospitality and submission to them that you were going to be a safe place for them to stay. The food you provided wasn't a light snack or a continental breakfast, uh, uh, no stale muffins or hard bagels or some egg-like substance that, uh, you know, you get in one of these hotels now. The expectation was that you provide a, a big meal, a great meal, a feast for your guests. And this was common practice through most societies at the times. We can even look back in uh, the book of Genesis, um, Genesis 18. There's a story of Abraham providing hospitality to strangers. 
I'm just going to read uh, quick some of those verses from Genesis 18. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great tree of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, if I found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under the tree. Let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. And well, very well, they answered, do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get some fine flour and knead it and bake it into bread. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf, gave it to his servant and who hurried to prepare it. He brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. And while they ate, he stood near them under the tree. Now I think we, we read this and think that Abraham knew who his, his guests were when they were still outside the tent. Um, but I think that really Abraham is just providing the standard of hospitality here. He learned later who was visiting him. Our Jewish audience would look at this level of hospitality and they would expect that same standard, but they'd even take it to a next level. If you were to look at texts from Deuteronomy and Leviticus about hospitality, you see not only hospitality to strangers and foreigners like all other societies, you know, God commands us to do that, or his people to do that as well, but God broadens the scope to include all vulnerable peoples. Exodus 22, do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner or stranger. Do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. Leviticus 23, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I could go on, but Throughout the Old Testament, wherever God talks about hospitality, he talks not just of the foreigner and the stranger, but also of the widow, the orphan, and the poor. God extends the scope of hospitality to include all vulnerable peoples. I don't know about you, but so far hospitality is sounding like a little bit bigger prospect than I thought it was going to be. Christian hospitality is a big undertaking, and it runs counter to our Western sensibilities. I think the concept of modern Western hospitality is about entertainment and fun and rest. But Christian hospitality is about love and justice and sacrifice. <clears throat> Remember, hospitality is the love of the vulnerable whether they be strangers or foreigners or the poor. That's the what of hospitality, the love of the vulnerable. Let's move on to the why of hospitality. Why should we show hospitality to strangers or foreigners or the poor? Well, our text points to two different reasons. The first is not explicitly in the text, but it's rather based on the audience. And I just talked about how in many places in the Old Testament, God calls his people to show hospitality to strangers and foreigners and the poor. Well, in those passages, the command to show hospitality was usually followed by a reason, a because. And almost always the reason went something like this. Remember that you were foreigners in Egypt, in the land of Egypt. The unspoken part of that, remember, is until I brought you out of the land of Egypt, until I brought you out of the wilderness and gave you a homeland. God is saying, remember that you were a foreigner once and a wanderer, and I showed you hospitality and gave you a land to go to. So go and show that same hospitality to others. In our text it says, continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. We're called to show hospitality in a way that recognizes that we were strangers and foreigners. 
We were in prison and mistreated until God showed us hospitality. The hospitality of his grace through Jesus' death on the cross. There's an old saying, uh, some of you might have used this, some of your parents might have used this, there but for the grace of God go I. Uh, is often used to recognize that without God's intervention in our life, we would be in some much worse predicament. We might resemble somebody that we're passing on the street or, um, or somebody that we encountered. That's the one of the whys of hospitality. There but for the grace of God go I. Show hospitality, because if it were not for God's grace, you would be the one needing hospitality. If that were not reason enough, our text points to even more. The reference about providing hospitality to angels is more than a reminder of Abraham's story that I just read. Um, If you're not familiar with the story, this goes on, and Abraham realizes that it's the Lord and his angels that were visiting him. I used to read that part of the text, you know, that uh, remember you might have been entertaining angels. That was some kind of warning. You might bring on some sort of punishment. You might get zapped if you, if you don't show hospitality because it might be an angel. It was kind of a, a scary proposition. But really, I think it's more of a you might miss out on something. It's that kind of message. You might miss out on something that there is a spiritual aspect to providing hospitality. That when we provide hospitality, we can be assured that God is with us in those simple actions. Commentator William Lane even goes so far as to say that providing hospitality has a sacramental quality to it. That the simple elements of hospitality can be extraordinary in their power. In providing hospitality, and in providing hospitality, we're rewarded. Remember that in the Abraham story, after he showed hospitality, he was blessed by his guests. So we provide hospitality not just out of gratitude, but because providing hospitality allows us to take part in something bigger. John Piper put it this way, When we practice hospitality, we experience the refreshing joy of becoming conduits of God's hospitality rather than becoming self-decaying cul-de-sacs. Think about that. The joy of receiving God's hospitality decays and dies if it doesn't flourish in our own hospitality to others. So you can be a conduit of God's hospitality or you can be a dead end where God's hospitality decays and dies. Do you want to be a conduit or a dead end? Why do we need to show hospitality? Because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were wanderers and strangers and foreigners and in prison and poor and mistreated, Jesus showed us the ultimate hospitality by bringing us into his family through his death on the cross. That's the why. So we have the what and the why. So here's some hows. Henry Nouwen gave a a wonderful definition of hospitality. I've shared it with you before. uh, And I think it's helpful as we think about the hows of hospitality. Nouwen wrote that hospitality, sorry, work jumped in there. (laughs) Nouwen wrote that hospitality is the creation of free space in which the stranger can enter and become a friend. Hospitality is the creation of free space in which the stranger can enter and become a friend. Hospitality is safe space. It's an essential element of hospitality. In our world right now, it's needed so much more. The promise of free space allows someone to enter in and feel that they're going to be heard and listened to. And that act alone will go far in allowing strangers to become friends. David Augsburger said, being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person they're almost indistinguishable. 
that just being heard means being loved. In our world right now, it's more common for someone to be shouted down as soon as they start to share their views than it is to be heard. Look at just about any level of government right now, and you see a lot of shouting and not a whole lot of listening. It's even happening in the church. This past summer at our denomination synod, the gathering for representatives of the entire CRC, a number of delegates left the meeting before it ended when they felt that room for disagreement was no longer available. They felt that there was no hospitality anymore, that there was no free space. This was in a gathering of brothers and sisters in Christ. Not a gathering of strangers or foreigners. Brothers and sisters in Christ could not feel safe. The creation of free space is absolutely necessary. And the great thing is that you can define space in so many ways. Space can be created in the design of an actual physical space like our, our sanctuary. I'm sure that the architect and the, the people from the church when this was designed were thinking about how to make this a welcoming space. Space can be created through your language just by being quiet sometimes. Space can be created through your body language. So here's some just a few ideas. When you walked into church today, you may have seen a member of our welcome ministry walking about, greeting people. And this team is especially looking out for the visitors or the new people or people who might not be that connected. They're a vital part of the hospitality here at BCRC. And I'm positive that they could use more help. I asked. If you're interested, talk to Cindy Steensma. And yes, I did check with her because otherwise I would not have been very hospitable by surprising her with that. We, they need more volunteers, people who are willing to go and welcome the new people. Something we can all work on because even if you've been here a long time, there are probably some strangers. This is a big group of people. I've been here a long time and there's some of you I don't know, um, even some who may have been here as long as I have. Now, think about the, the coffee and lemonade time after church. And by the way, making coffee, making lemonade is hospitality. So if you want to do that, I'm sure we could use more volunteers to do that as well. But think about that coffee and lemonade time. And I think that those of you who are extroverts think of this as some sort of human pinball game time. You're going to bounce from group to group. You're going to gain points as you go along. You're going to get more energy as you go along. And you're going to leave after 30 or 40 minutes just totally on fire. But for new people or visitors or introverts like me, that 30 or 40 minutes is one of the most terrifying times of the week. Walking out to a group of people that I don't necessarily know or am familiar with is, is absolutely terrifying. So when you go out after the service, look for somebody new to talk to. Don't go to the same people that you always go to. If you're standing with a group, make sure there's free space available. I, I go from group to group sometimes and you'll have five or six people and they're in a circle and there's no place to get in. So you walk around the edges and you kind of look for the opening where I can kind of insert myself or something like that. But when you make a group like that, Add space for a couple more. Just leave the group open. It goes a long way. When you're talking to somebody, maybe somebody new, invite them out to lunch or over to lunch. Um, I don't like to, you know, I think my wife would be very unhappy if I suddenly started inviting people over to lunch, so invite them out to lunch. It's okay. If you feel called or challenged, I mentioned earlier about divisions in the church. If that's something that, that uh, raised something in you and you feel called to uh, learn how to create free space, there are groups to do it. I can tell you about the Colossian Forum or Better Together Project. There are groups working in the CRC right now to create space where we can live together um, 
not always agreeing. Here's one that might be a little more challenging, a little scarier. If you've been a member of the same small group here for maybe three, four years, consider leaving your group. Leave your group and start a new group. Maybe get with somebody else from your group or, or somebody else or a couple of people. Start a new small group and invite people you don't know. Maybe invite somebody from outside of this church. And I say this because a small group is possibly the best way we can create free space in a church, a space to enter as strangers and become friends. I've been a member of a lot of small groups here uh, over the years, and I've got to know so many of you on such a different level. And it has been such a rewarding time. But if I would have stayed with the same group, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have known all of you. I know it's hard to leave a group that you've grown close to, but it will expand your family here at BCRC, and it, it might be a way to uh, expand the family of BCRC a little, uh, and a, a way to follow through on our Acts series. Here's another hard one. Invite someone to come to church with you. Um, tell me to take them out to lunch afterwards. I think hospitality and food are just like interconnected. And maybe that was my Dutch upbringing or something like that. Hospitality and food always went together. But uh, tell them you take them out to lunch if they come and, you know, come to church with you and we can talk about it afterwards over lunch and I'll pay, um, which is not part of my Dutch upbringing. <laughs> but it's probably good for us to do. Hospitality is an essential part of evangelism. Then there's hospitality outside the church. Remember that God calls us to remember the vulnerable in a special way. The poor, the vulnerable, the immigrant, the asylum seeker. Consider partnering with organizations that reach out to these groups. Um, we're going to have an offering in a little bit for uh, ASJ, the Association for a More Just Society. Um, the Milwaukee Rescue Mission, Safe Families, Tesoros de Dios. All of these ministries are really at their heart hospitality ministries. They're trying to reach out to people who are vulnerable. You can donate your time, you can donate your money, but think about how you can be a part of that. Think about how the church can be a solution to the immigration crisis. It's not a political solution maybe that's needed, it's, it's maybe a spiritual solution. Christian hospitality should be especially concerned with the plight of the foreigner and the immigrant because we were once foreigners wandering in the desert until Jesus gave us a home. Take some time this week. Think about how you might be called to show hospitality. Spend some time asking God where he's leading you. Look for some open doors where you can create space. Remember to show hospitality to strangers because you were a stranger once. You were a stranger and Jesus showed you hospitality and brought you out of the wilderness and gave you a home in his kingdom. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, while we were still foreigners wandering in the desert, you had mercy on us. And through the grace of Jesus, you chose to create space for us in your family. If it were not for your hospitality, we'd still be lost in the wilderness. Thank you for loving us in this way. Lord, help us to be conduits of your hospitality. Don't let your hospitality decay and die because of our inability or unwillingness to love the stranger, the foreigner, the poor, the vulnerable just like you loved us. Stir a passion in our hearts for hospitality. Equip us to create spaces where strangers can enter in and become friends. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of response is Wonderful, Merciful Savior.